Okay, this is OKCPHP. Welcome. Uh, this is one of the Techlahoma user groups, and we're here in Starspace 46, thanks to Techlahoma and Starspace 46. Tonight we're doing lightning talks, and, and not real lightning, I hope, but <laughs> that may well be too. Oh. Um, so lightning talks are a forum where we have about 10 minutes apiece, and we usually have multiple speakers. So. I'm doing one of the presentations, and Carrie's supposed to do another presentation, but Carrie's not here, so I may be doing both of them tonight. <laughs> the first one, let's start through this. I uh, promised to do a little walkthrough on Bug Snag. So right now we're looking at the documentation on Bug Snag, and you can see this is a, a tool for capturing things that go wrong with your application in production. So once you've deployed it to your production environment, it'll capture logs, um, it'll capture the stack trace, um, it'll categorize all of those things. It can interact with your ticket system, if you have Jira or some other ticket system to assign bugs. It can interact with Slack and HipChat. Um, and it can work with all of the languages that you, and, and platforms that you see here on the, on the left. So we're interested in PHP tonight, and it actually integrates with several different frameworks. I've used Laravel, so let's look real quickly at the Laravel. If this is too complicated, there's probably a real easy way to go through this to install Bugsnag on a, a simple project. You can see it's got a composer package to install with a, a dedicated Bugsnag Laravel package. <clears throat> and then with Laravel, a lot of things are instantiated in your project through a service provider. So that's what's happening here. We have a service provider that you add to your application and that is going to initialize Bugsnag and do all the background stuff. Let's look at the code in my application. Now under Laravel, everything is mostly under app. And in this case, the interesting stuff is here under HTTP middleware. There's a Bugsnag middleware, there it is. And this is just going to do a little configuration for us to let us add some data from this particular application into each of the exceptions. When an exception gets thrown, you can see this, this method here is set before notify function. So we're going to pass this function, sort of a callback, just like you'd use in JavaScript. This is a PHP callback function. We're going to hand this to Bugsnag. And when Bugsnag has an exception, it will call this function with the error object. So that error object has a, a function called set metadata and has several other things on it. But um, set metadata will allow us to capture custom data from our application. And that's what you see happening here. All of this stuff about location and customer and customer name and all that, that's, that's application specific code. But down here we're passing a, an array of data to Bugsnag. And that's gonna show up along with the exception on the Bugsnag site when we go to look at it. All right, so Bugsnag is gonna install itself through that service provider. It becomes the exception handler where it gets into the chain of exception handlers for this application and we've added some uh, custom detail to it. Now, when an exception happens, usually the way I work with it is, is through our Slack channel. We have a dedicated channel for exceptions, and all of these are the bug snack stuff that's landing here. And we have it categorized into multiple different areas. So like conversations is the application and the web interface, the JavaScript, all lands under this label. So you see right there a little snapshot of a JavaScript exception. And the PHP stuff is under Conversations API. So here we see a PDO exception, connection timed out. This is probably not gonna be an interesting one, but since it's here and convenient, um, clicking on that and hopefully we're gonna go to the browser any minute now. Let's try that one.
There we go. Okay. And we get three of them open now. And all of them want me to log in. Okay. Let's see if I can log in. Because so I thought it was attached to my Gmail account credentials. Okay, here we go. So there's that PDO exception. And we can see here's the, the URL fragment. This is where it happened. And the first tab here is showing us the stack trace. Now, it's not, not just the stack trace. It's only part of it. It's only uh, the actual stuff that I might care about. So there's... Um, this is in my code, app, repositories, eloquent user token repository. That's my code. This is my code. But there's all kinds of other things in here that are Laravel code. If I click on full trace, I can see all of that. But most of the time, I, I don't care because that's Laravel code. That's already tested, and I'm not going to change it. So most of the time, I can leave that filtered out. And I can see exactly what line that exception happened on. There's the exception. Now, you see there are additional tabs here. So under app, you've got a couple of things that are specific to the, what version of the app was running. Because when we deploy, we tell Bugsnag what, what new version was out there now. And so it keeps track of things. It can tell us, um, or we can tell Bugsnag, we fixed this bug in uh, 1.0.127. So when 127 rolls out, it will archive this stuff and uh, then or we can we can archive it manually and it will tell us if it reoccurs in the next version okay so under device this um, apparently happened from a desktop so I, I'm seeing an IP address here here's the request this is everything that was sent to my application to hit that um, this, this URL, this path, there's all the headers. There's a get method. You can see the full URL, the user agent. And this one apparently did not have any parameters submitted. So you don't see that, that information. And then this user tab is the stuff that we sent to it. So you see it's it's got... I don't like this about it, Bugsnag. It, it overwrites the ID with an IP address. So that's the way they identify the user. Uh, if we go back to the code, flip back over here, you can see it actually ran through this part. And that got overwritten. So it didn't, didn't actually go through this, this code down here. But let's look at another one. Oh, and you can see this, the same error, the PDO exception with the 2002 connection timed out occurred multiple times. You can see the times, 2005, 2005, 2005. These all happened at the same time. So we had some kind of network exception going on right there. Up here, I can assign that to a team member. I can link over to JIRA and see the, the ticket that was actually created for that. I can close the ticket. I can tell it to, to ignore this for a short time, or I can tell it to ignore this completely. Don't ever show me this event again, All right? I can see how many users, how many times this happened, 113, it affected 38 users in one release stage, which is production. Yeah, the P over here indicates this was production. Here are the categories again. So we go to Conversations API. We can see all the PHP errors that were captured by Bugsnag. There are two in an open status. And you can see how, how recently they occurred. So this one just happened four hours ago. Runtime exception. Nice. Here comes the rain. OK. Uh, and here you can see this, this problem we're having with Facebook that has occurred 16,000 times. 
and <laughs> is ongoing. So uh, we actually have somebody trying to fix that. Don't worry. Um, trying to find one that might be interesting. Yeah, do we need to close the doors? Yeah, probably. It's starting to happen. Okay. Yeah, it's closing. Yeah, we got pea sized halo. Great. Okay. This is one of the, the exceptions that actually went through that routine and, and accumulated that extra information that I was showing you here. So. Okay. okay, so this information down here, we can see the customer name now, the location name. This is all the, the uh, application specific data that I added to it. So I could add whatever I needed to there in order to diagnose this kind of error. Look at the request and see if this has request parameters on it. Yeah, here we go. This one's a post, and you can see all the data that was actually submitted along with that post. So this is supposed to help me recreate that or diagnose what happened there. So. Questions? This is on bugsnag.com. Yeah, it's software as a service. I don't know if you can install one locally and have your own server. Right. Haven't done that. But it's it's been very convenient to have it hosted. Um, How does this compare to like Sentry or the other ones out there? Uh, Sentry or Rollbar or, or um, it's very similar. All of those are similar. Um, they get you to the same point where you can diagnose what happened. You can see the stack trace and the variables that were submitted and all of that. Uh, I think this one's, I don't know, I haven't used the others extensively. I've used Rollbar a little bit. Um, but I can't really tell you how they compare. Okay. Let's call that good on Bug Snack. And Carrie's not here yet. And with the way the rain's coming down now, maybe he won't make it. So, shall we go ahead and look at the PSR stuff? Are you guys familiar with PSR and the PHP FIG, which is the Framework Interoperational Group? I think that's Framework Interop Group. It is a sort of voluntary. Um, organization with you know voluntary standards. Let me look them up here real quick. PHPfig.org. They have, I mean, the main product of them are these recommendations, which have no enforcement, of course. It's just we do this so that our, our code looks like everyone else's and interoperates with somebody else's. Uh, and the original intent of it was to be able to move packages from one framework to another. So you can use the same thing under Laravel and under Yi or whatever else, uh, Zen framework, whatever you wanted to use. All of those standards are numbered. And you see they're starting at one here. These are the accepted standards. Uh, there is a PSR zero, which is still important, even though it's marked as deprecated. 
it was the original auto loading standard and it defined how classes were supposed to be named in order to be auto loaded by a sort of standardized auto loader. Now that has been replaced with PSR4. So PSR4 is now the auto loader standard. The difference is the PSR0, the names were words separated by underscores, and those underscores then represented uh, <coughs> directory separators in the path to find that file. And in PSR4, they're using the namespaces, and the namespace separators are transformed into directory separators. Right. If that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, <laughs> just tell me. I, I can go into it a little further. Um, let's look at one of them. We'll look at that PSR4 to start with. Okay, and here, this is your namespace with potentially sub namespaces in between any number of those and then a class name. In order to auto load that, you would place that into a directory with the same names. You would tell it where to start, where the, the root of your namespaces start, what directory that corresponds to. And then it, the auto loader would be able to transform that namespace and class name into a file name. And then there's some additional things in here, like an auto loader must not throw exceptions. Right? If it doesn't find it, it should exit and allow potentially another auto loader to take over and, and find the file. Um, yeah, here's some examples of that auto loading. You see the namespace, Acme log writer would be in. Uh, that doesn't make sense, Acme log. <coughs> That looks more like PSR zero to me. Right here, Symphony Core is in vendor Symphony Core. Right. Okay. Yeah. You see, File Writer is is unchanged, that's the class name. So the underscore is not being changed in PSR4. Under PSR0, that will get changed into a directory separator. But in my understanding of it, this Acme, Log, and Writer all would be transformed into directory names. So, okay, hmm. maybe I should go read this one again. Where's Kerry when we need him? <laughs> um, PSR1 is a basic coding standard, and, it, and this is the one that's gonna generate a lot of argument from people, you know, everybody who wants spaces versus tabs, um, those kinds of things. Let's see if they touch on it here. They talk about the PHP tags, don't use it. Uh, they're actually still allowing the short tag here. Oh, this is the one where you have just a, a echo kind of statement, uh, but not the sh very short tag to start a file where you just have the question mark and the bracket. That one is, that one is not allowed under PSR1. And they're saying constants should be declared in uppercase. Class names should be declared in studly caps. And method names in camel case. 
So there is no standard offered here for variable names. You can do what you want. Yeah. Are there any browser configs or Are there any browser plugins or editors? There are definitely editors. Most of the editors do understand PSR 1 and 2, and I believe there's a later one coming on. Um, PHP Storm definitely understands those standards, and it can reformat things for you. Um, so the PSR1 is only part of this, the formatting standard. Here's one of the things that causes arguments. They, they always put the curly brace on the next line after a function or after a class. So. But on an if, the curly brace goes on the same line, right? <laughs> Okay, and, and this is requiring that PHP 5.3 and later, that that code uses namespaces. That's an example of a namespace. For 5.2, you can see that these two classes are sort of structured similarly, vendor model foo, and this is vendor model foo, and this is the old PSR zero style of class naming here. Constants to be uppercase. Properties, you can do anything you want. Um, intentionally avoids any recommendation, but recommends consistency. Whatever you're doing, do the same thing throughout your, your code base, whether that's a package or an application, all your developers should do the same. And the real reason for that is um, just so that when you open a file, you don't have to think about what the standard is or what you're looking at. You know when you see something that starts with a lowercase, that's a variable or it's a function. And if it starts with an uppercase, it's a class. And if it's all uppercase, it's a constant. You, you just easily recognize those things. Okay, PSR2 style guide continues from PSR1, expands on it here, and it, you can see it's much longer. You can see by the size of that elevator bar. Okay, and here, here we go. Code must use poor spaces, not tabs. So that's where a lot of people get, get really upset. But. Consistency is important. <laughs> no hard limit on lines, but 120 is recommended. Mm. Or 80 is recommended and 120 is a uh, soft limit. Okay, and then some things about blank lines. When to use blank lines. Visibility is um, those public or protected or private. Those things uh, must be declared on all properties and methods. And control structure keywords like if or for or with should have one space after them before the parentheses. But function calls do not have that space after them before the parentheses. So. Okay, so here's some example code. There's namespace, and then there's a blank line after the namespace, and then there's the, the use instructions, another blank line, and then the class declaration. You can see extends, implements, all on the same line, and then the opening brace on the next line.
Here's another thing that gets people upset is that you must use the Linux line feed. So if you're a Windows person, you have to you have to get your editor to cooperate with that or convert all your your line endings. And then PHP files must end with a blank line. Um, also, do not use this closing tag. Now, the reason, do you guys know the reason for not using the closing tag? Have you heard of this? If you have a closing tag and then anything after it, that constitutes sort of a um, content. And if you, how does this? Sorry? Right, you can't send headers after the content has been started. So you would not be able to, to call the, the header function, send header function. Uh, if you just had accidentally a closing tag and a blank line or a, a space after it in some file anywhere that you were including. So the recommendation has been always if, you're, if this file is to be included, don't close the tag. Don't, don't close the PHP tags, always just leave that off. So you see in all the frameworks, most of the frameworks, I suppose, they'll just leave that off. Uh, and your editors generally have templates that start you off, like PHP Storm always, it'll create a, a template for you when you create a new file. Never includes that tag. Yeah, just jump down, hang on. Okay, there's no hard line limit. And now the, change, the soft limit is 120 characters. This is the same as previously. No trailing white spaces on lines. Usually the editors like um, PHP Storm and what is the one they use on Apple? Anybody run Apple? You run Mac? What do you use for an editor? Adam? Yeah. Okay. That's not the one I was thinking of, but... Um. Coda. Yeah. An IDE, yeah. <laughs> okay. Not a, not a big Mac audience tonight, <laughs> but... Net beans. I'm talking from Mac. There's there's one that was on Mac that um okay. Yeah, NetBeans, Eclipse, and Peace Restore are available on all those platforms. But I'll think of it here in a minute, but it's not important. Okay. All right, this is a fairly long standard, so it's, it's a good thing to go read through it and understand what the what standard's being recommended there. You don't have to follow it, of course. Let's, like I was saying, this is all volunteer. You can choose to use this standard rather than write your own. There's a standard there to just adopt. Uh, that makes it easier. Is that Xcode? Xcode, oh, yeah, that might be it. For Apple? Yeah. Okay. You can tell I'm not a, not a Mac person. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can run PHP on a Mac. Yeah. Lots and lots of, if you go on the, the app store, 
Yeah. Okay, this is a, PSR 3 is a slightly different kind of uh, definition or standard. This is a logger interface. Um, and it's trying to define, you know, an interface is a sort of contract between the application and a class that's gonna implement a function for you. Uh, loggers are fairly common things to, to use on different platforms. Um, and there's monolog, and there's a bunch of other things. Bugsnag would, might, might, be, might function as a logger in some circumstances. It could be implemented that way. So this standard is trying to standardize how you interface to a logger, so you could just swap out the logger and use a different one. Okay. But PSR, this is PSR 3. Hang on one second, because. I thought there was a different standard that addressed loggers. Well, I guess that's it. And you see down here, there's a, an extended coding style guide. So there is another one, even beyond PSR 2. Um, Okay, so you've got a logger interface, a caching interface, HTTP message interface. Those are all, and there's a container interface in review here. Those are all attempting to standardize how you would interact with different components so that those components could be swapped in and out for a, in a given application more easily. Um, So the logger interface, in a nutshell, exposes eight methods to write logs to the RFC levels. And these are the, these are the levels that it uses, debug, info, notice, warning, error, all of those. So you have a message and a level. And that way, the log writer has a, a choice to make there. If, if, if you don't want to see debug level messages, you know, it can just drop those. Or info level, it could just drop those but emergency alert, critical error, those you might be writing to a log, you might be sending to someone's pager or uh, dropping into the uh, chat platform or something. Right. Let's not go through that in too detail. This is supposed to be lightning talks. This is supposed to be fast. <laughs> so caching interface. See if we can figure this one out in uh, two minutes. So it's defining things like the time to live, the expiration time, key. And it's defining terms here and then the types of data that are going to be cached. Covers error handling and okay, here is the definition for the interfa interface. So you should see any implementation of this interface should have a, a get key function that would 
and here's a description of it if you want to go into detail. So, and then get something from the cache. Just hit set something on the cache. So that's really the extent of it, right? Look at message interface real quick. Because I think this is going to be request and response type stuff. Yeah, server side code receives an HTTP request message and returns an HTTP response message. Uh, and then it gives examples of how we would want to interact with this request. So I expect somewhere to see the same kind of interface definition. Obviously, a request is kind of a complicated thing, so it, it, there's going to be a lot of stuff you have to cover here. There we go. There's the, the request. Now, all of these things, these... Um, this, this is actual code, and this is over in GitHub. There's a project for each of these that you can actually check those out and then write your code against that interface and you know, stay up to date with it that way. So you can add it to your project just as, like any other package. Okay. Okay. And let's look at, last of all, one of the more important things here, the huggable interface. <laughs> it dumped us over to GitHub, so just like we were talking about. All right. This is just a proposed standard. It hasn't been adopted yet. The spec is to improve the overall amicability and cooperative spirit of the PHP community through a means of inter-project affection and support. Okay, the mutually assured hug. It finds two interfaces, huggable and group huggable. So a huggable object expresses affection and support for another object by invoking its hug method, passing this as the first parameter. An object whose hug method is invoked must hug the calling object back at least once. So you, see, you can see how this is very important stuff. And then there's group huggable. Yeah, you gotta extend this You have group huggable. I'm going to write one of these. But I, I think it needs some extension here because I've got a three-year-old who you know, sometimes refuses to be hugged or at least refuses to be hugged back, or to hug back. You can hug him, but he's not going to hug back. So I think they've overlooked something in the functionality there. All right. So now you know about PHP fig the framework interop group, and the PSRs. You know what those are. PSR zero is obsolete. PSR four is the thing. Okay. Seven twenty nine. We haven't been hailed on anymore. So. <laughs> okay. We're going to wrap it up here then. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll let Carrie make the